not often one man is able to move the hearts of nations, to usher change across race and age. But when someone gives their life to a divine calling, amazing things happen. That is the legacy of Billy Graham. Tonight, I'm glad to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received, your sins forgiven, your burdens lifted. Billy was born in 1918, during the end of World War I. Growing up on his family's dairy farm in North Carolina, no one could have imagined what God had in store for this hardworking young man. When he was 13 years old, he was in a play at school. His voice carried so well. I says, I, I just think there's something in that boy that we haven't discovered yet. <laughs> at age 15, he was invited to hear a man named Mordecai Ham preach at a citywide revival meeting. I was taken by a friend, and I became fascinated. And then the Spirit of God began to speak to me as I went back night after night. And uh, one night when the invitation was given, I just said, Lord, I'm going. From this moment, life would never be the same for Billy. A new passion burned in his heart to see lives changed. He went on to college and began preaching the good news of Jesus to anyone who would listen. It was during those years of academics and Sunday sermons that Billy met Ruth. The young missionary girl raised in China would become his best friend the true love of his life. And he would be the first to say that without Ruth, his growth as a preacher and evangelist would not have been possible. When I came out and saw her standing there, he said, that is Ruth Bell. At that moment, I was in love. And not only in love, something told me inside she'll be your wife. Now, it took her nearly a year to come to that same conclusion. Word of his powerful message spread quickly. He preached on the stages of concert halls and auditoriums and over the airwaves of radio and television. And soon, people began lining the streets by the tens of thousands just to hear him speak. Before we can have world peace, we must have peace within our heart. And bis wir Weltfrieden haben, müssen wir es Frieden. There's only one road to heaven. You say, but if I believe God, isn't that enough? I want to tell you before you leave Madison Square Garden this night of May 15th, you can find everything that you've been searching for in Christ. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. He was a mighty man. The Bible tells us that in spite of our sins and rebellion, that God loves us. As countless people responded to the move of God's Spirit, the demands on Billy seemed constant. But it was Ruth and their children that brought him strength and joy. Their home was a special place where he could simply spend time as a father and loving husband. These moments were precious to Billy. Yes, uh, there is a great sense of loneliness. And if there is a price to pay in this work, uh, it is that, uh, that I'm not with my children. God's calling on Billy's life took him from the largest stadiums to the most remote villages of Africa. He spoke not only of God's forgiveness, but also against the evils of racism, communism, and social injustice in our world. And don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. He was one of the most sought after men of this age, turning down the political stage and Hollywood spotlight in order to continue his ministry to the lost, weary, and forgotten. His message was unfaltering, remaining true to the gospel and his steadfast faith in Christ. I'm asking you tonight to follow him, to serve him, to let him come into your heart and forgive you. Be forgiven. Know that you're going to heaven. What can be said about one man's life? For Billy Graham, let it be said that he lived his life to bring the lost and hurting to Christ. Are you willing to receive Christ tonight? Because you may never have a moment quite like this again. You come and receive him into your heart and say yes to him. Hundreds of you right now, just get up out of your seat and say tonight, I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to follow him from this night on.
Well, it's truly an honor for me to be here uh, this morning. Uh, your pastor, Pastor Gary, had called me several months ago and asked if I would come up here, and uh, this date had been set in stone for many months. And uh, obviously last Wednesday morning, my grandfather uh, fell asleep and uh, woke up in heaven. And so your pastor said, well, are you still coming? And I said, sure. I mean, what better place to be um, but be up here? And then uh, not knowing at the time, my grandfather's actually going to be laying in the Capitol here on, on Thursday, so, um, or, or Wednesday, I believe. So uh, quite, a, quite a, uh, a great opportunity for me to be here. So I, I am honored, and I thank you all for welcoming me here. Um, I also understand. Thank you. Um, I also understand that last week, uh, uh, Pastor Gary had made a suggestion that since he's been preaching on the rapture and end times, that if the rapture occurred between last week and this week, um, don't worry, Stefan will still be here. <laughs> so um, I understand that, um, and I am here. Um, it is somewhat perplexing the fact that your pastor is not, so, <laughs> and uh, neither is Billy Graham. So. I'm thinking um, maybe the rapture has occurred and the rest of us are stuck here and uh, this is some sort of a purgatory, uh, consistent fog and rain and cold weather for as long as we can imagine. Um, but there is hope because I come from Florida and it was 78 degrees with big white puffy clouds and balmy and so I can just imagine what heaven will be like um, when we finally get there, which we all will within our lifetime, if you understand what I mean, because we're all going to die. So, um, so at some point in your lifetime, you will get to heaven, uh, Lord willing and praying. So again, it is my honor uh, to be here and, uh, and be able to share with you uh, this evening. I have another sermon I had prepared, and it's really a good one, and actually a really good one. And I guess I'm just going to come back and preach it, because I said to Gary, I said, and I sort of feel like I need to do the Billy Graham thing just because God's sort of stirring something in my heart. Um, and I've got a, a particular few things I wanted to share. And I thought, you don't mind if I maybe do a little call an audible and, and it's sort of a, a different kind of a message. And he said, no, that would be great. Um, you know, little did he know he's going to be raptured in a few days. So he didn't really <laughs> didn't really matter to him what I preach on. So um, so um, in that video. Oh, let me open it with a quick word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to come together as the body of Christ. I mean, Lord, we say that so often, but we sometimes forget what that really means. We come together as family. We come together as friends, old friends, new friends, strangers amongst our midst that start feeling like they're old friends as well. Lord, for some, we come into this sanctuary, this building, this facility, and uh, Lord, we've had an amazing week. I mean, we got married, or we got a promotion, or that doctor's report we were worried about came back better than expected. Um, I mean, things are good. And then there's a pile of us, Lord, that says this was the worst week ever. I mean, we're going through a divorce. We got a bad report from the doctor. We got laid off at work. Our kids run amok. I mean, we're just frustrated. And then there's a pile of us that are somewhere in between. Lord, we're easily distracted as human beings. As we sit here together, we can start drifting off to something we saw on the news or some movie we binge watch on Netflix or some problem we're having. And our prayer is that, Lord, we would just be focused right now on your word and on what it is that you want us to hear. The Bible says, be hearers of the word, God, but not only hearers, but doers. So I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just fill us all, just descend upon us like that, those foggy clouds outside, and that, Lord, you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that as, even as I have the privilege to speak, it's not my words that come out of my mouth. It's your words. If anything is of me, let it be easily forgotten. Let it go in one ear and out the other. But anything of you, let it find good-hearted soil that we can grow from. We love you, Lord. We love your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, in that video was referenced quite an amazing person. And I will take the liberty to say that that amazing person was my grandmother. My grandmother was spunky. 
And if you ever had time to spend with my grandmother, she was the fun one of the bunch. Uh, she grew up, as, as the little uh, video said, as the child of missionaries in China. So she gr was born and raised in China. Um, and then made her way back to the United States, and that's where she met this young Billy Graham uh, character, and the rest is history. My grandmother knew the Word of God like nobody's business. If we had more time, I could tell you all kinds of stories about my grandmother. Always a twinkle in her eye, never knowing what she was going to say, loved practical jokes, was the eternal optimist, uh, the last 15 years of her life, she lived in more or less chronic pain from an injury she occurred during a fall, but you'd never know it if you saw her. Always a smile, always engaging, always wanting to give back to you more than you ever gave to her. My grandfather, on the other hand, uh, if he had a headache, he was convinced it was a brain tumor and that he would be dead within weeks. Um, if he woke up one morning and there was a big meeting in town that he were going to do one of those big outdoor meetings and he looked at the distance and he saw this little cloud in the horizon, he was convinced that a thunderstorm was on its way and that nobody was going to show up at this meeting. In other words, he was somewhat of a pessimist. Now, you wouldn't necessarily know that watching him preach, but he had an ability to complain from time to time. And so there's so many fun, funny stories we have as family, as my grandfather complaining about something. And, and not in a necessarily negative way, he just sort of, you know, took things very seriously. Um, one day he was in Europe, and my m grandmother was in the United States, and she was having some sort of an illness with high fever. And he told her on the telephone, he says, look, I've done some research on this fever you have, and I've talked to my doctors. And I've come to the conclusion that by morning, you will either have severe brain damage or you will be dead. So, and he said it seriously. I mean, he really believed it. I mean, this was who he was. I remember taking a walk with him on the beach once and we were in Florida. I call him Daddy Bill. And I said, Daddy Bill, um, how are you? Which was a mistake because you don't ask him how he's feeling. And he goes, oh, not good. I go, well, what do you mean, not good? anticipating, you know, a plethora of diseases he was going to talk to me about. And he goes, oh, I just came back from the Mayo Clinic, and uh, they've been diagnosing stuff in my body. It's not good. And I go, what, what, seriously, what's going on? He goes, they've found diseases in me that they don't even have names for yet. <laughs> and I had to keep a straight face, thinking, seriously, you are the incubator of diseases that mankind has yet to discover, but they somehow find themselves housed in the body of Billy Graham, and he was completely serious about that. So one day, my grandmother, sitting at the dining room table, hearing my grandfather talk about one of his many ailments, um, and here she actually had an ailment, she looked at him and with a straight face said, why don't you shut up and die like a Christian? <laughs> So that is my grandmother, and I think that's a great bumper sticker. And so therefore, I've entitled this message, Shut Up and Die Like a Christian. Now, so on Wednesday morning last week, my grandfather died like a Christian. And as much laughter comes from that statement, it's made me think a lot about that statement. What does it really mean? I mean, when you really actually think about that statement, what does it mean to die like a Christian? What did she mean by that? I mean, for some of us that are historians and we read wonderful, great uh, pieces of literature about church history and we read about people that martyred for their faith. Some of them are famous, most of which will never know their names. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the hall of faith. And we often think, well, dying like a Christian might be giving your life for Christ, martyrdom. And certainly that would be the case. But the vast majority of us will probably never be martyred for our faith. So what does that mean to die like a Christian? 
Well, there is lots to be said about my grandfather, and in the, in the days to come, there will be a lot of stories, and for those of you that want to dig a little deeper, you can find out all about his history and his life and the various meetings he had and the, and the impact he had on current culture and, and the church history, and there's a lot that has been written about my grandfather, but I'm going to take a few minutes this morning and share some perspectives that I have as his eldest grandson, somebody that was with him, that was influenced by him, and somebody who watched his life when nobody else was watching. And I go back to that statement of what it means to die like a Christian. And there's a few things I want to highlight your attention to. His favorite Bible verse, his life verse, was Philippians 1.6. It says, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to the day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. Many of you perhaps know that verse. You've heard it quoted. Think about the implications of that verse. Be confident of this. One of the biggest struggles many of us have in our Christian faith is our confidence in our faith. Because for many of us, we get trapped into sort of this list of, here's the good things I do, and here's the not so good things I do. Here's the things that I do that makes God happy. Here's the things that I do that makes God not happy. Uh, we tend to have circumstantial faith, which means if things are going good in your life, then you sort of say, well, God's on my side. If things are not going good in your life, well, God must be punishing me, or God must be asleep at the wheel, or God must not be on my side anymore. And maybe in our ex most extreme despair, God, do you even exist? Be confident of this. What am I to be confident of? It's a promise. It's not be confident based on your feelings of the day or based upon your circumstances. It's being confident of a promise. And what is this promise? Be confident this, that he, meaning God, who started, who initiated his work in your life, will never quit until he's done, until the day of Christ Jesus. That alone... That promise relieves all pressure on all of us to sit there and go, I have to make God happy by watching all the things that I do and don't do and this sort of performance Christianity that is toxic within our Christian culture around the world. This sense of feeling like I must perform in order to earn God's favor, God's blessings. Because of what God has done for me. Remember that Bible verse? We love him because, because what? Because he first loved us. In other words, because of what God has done in my life, I naturally want to love God back. In other words, I love my wife. I'm faithful to my wife, not because I'm afraid of the consequences of if I'm not. It's because I choose to love her because of this great relationship and love that she has for me and that I have for you. It's a natural cascading effect. So as we bathe in the love of God, now all of a sudden I find myself desiring to do God's will. I find myself naturally saying, Lord, let me do your will today. Lord, I surrender my life to you today. It's not a matter of Boy, I've got this pressure of this do's and don'ts and do's and don'ts, and I sort of feel some days I do less and some days I do more. Some days God's happy, some days God's not happy. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on the day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. That was my grandfather's anchor verse. That was his life verse. That was the thing that sort of was, was his compass heading. And it's the same for him as it is for you. That ought to be our compass heading. And God is doing this incredible work in our lives. Here are a handful of characteristics I saw as a result of what I noticed in my grandfather. <coughs> One was this incredible humility he had. If you talk to anybody that ever met my grandfather, they would say that is a genuinely humble person. I can say with all honesty, I know very few genuinely humble people. I am convicted of that in my own life on a regular basis. Am I truly a humble person? Now, humility isn't just, you know, you allow someone to sit in the front seat of the car and you take the back seat or, you know, you don't have to have the best seat at the restaurant table or you open the door for somebody and you're just a genuinely nice person. You know, that's not what humility is about. Humility is that you're no longer the center of your universe. 
In other words, if your friend gets a promotion that you should have deserved and you find yourself upset about that, thinking this isn't fair, I should get that promotion, my friend got it instead, what is that saying? That to me, when it happens in my life, is a slight indicator that I'm still the center of my universe. It's still about me. And that rather than jumping for joy for my friend and the good favor that they have at their job, I am now, it's all about me. Why didn't I get it? Those are characteristics in various aspects. Take some time to read. There's a classic book called Humility by a guy named Andrew Murray. Take some time and read that and you will find yourself realizing just how unhumble each and every of us are. You may think you're humble. I think I'm humble. I mean, I tell my wife all the time, honey, I'm a humble guy. You got it made. Now the reality is I'm not. So here's my grandfather, one of the most humblest men I've ever known. If you find yourself in Philippians, this is a great verse, and I, at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the same mind of Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus was God, and, and he was on equal plane with God. But, because he was on equal plane with God, because he was but, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming to the likeness of men. In other words, he humbled himself to say, I'm God, but I'm going to become like man. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He was the one man that could have circumvented death and said, I don't want to experience death. That's something that none of us here can do that. We will all die. His humility, we are in, we've told in Philippians that our humility should be that of Christ. Another thing that's very much tethered to humility is authenticity. And even as I talk about authenticity, I'm going to bring its twin brother, its twin sister of integrity. Because you begin to connect all these and they become a mosaic of a picture. It's not just one thing. You can't just be a, a, a humble person but have no authenticity and no integrity. You can't just be a man or woman of integrity but not be humble. These things all begin to form this beautiful mosaic as they become these characteristics of God in us. But I thought about authenticity and integrity, and there's wonderful words about integrity and authenticity and definitions. But in my mind, it's a very simple thing. Integrity is this idea of a promise being made that's fulfilled. So this afternoon, I'm going to, Lord willing, get on an airplane, JetBlue flight out of Reagan, and I'm going to fly down, back down to Fort Lauderdale. JetBlue's making a promise to me that they're going to take me from point A to point B and I'm willing to pay them for that promise. It's a promise. If you go visit your doctor, and the doctor says, here's my plaque, I went to school, I'm an expert on that. So you say, I'm willing to let you then diagnose me. Well, you trust that, that this person has made a promise. They're really a doctor. If they weren't a doctor, if you're a school teacher, if it's a first responder, that's just pretending because they bought the suit somewhere, and they're really not a first responder, that's catastrophic. But a person who says, in the time of crisis, I will take care of this situation. Why? Because I'm trained. There's integrity with that. Authenticity. We live in a world that is thirsty for authenticity. Among the, the, the millennials and the Gen Zs and all the other various groups that are sort of the 40 and under and stuff like that, one of the big things in corporate America, for example, is, is the brand authentic? We've all tired. We're all sick and tired of being told one thing and finding out reality is another. Whether it's in Hollywood, which we've seen a plethora of that this year, whether it's in Washington, we see a plethora of that all the time, whether it's in Wall Street, we see that all the time. The reality is we all have become, we've become, there's an angst in our culture. There's an angst in, our, in the way we think about life because we never know what is truth anymore. What is true when I'm being told this by somebody? Is it really this or is it something else? So what we've become is we're going, look, I don't really care what it is you are saying. I want to know, is it true? Is it authentic? 
whether it's your belief in your mom and dad when you were growing up and then they got divorced and also now you go, I don't know if I believe in marriage and the family anymore, whether it's I believe in my church, but then my church gets weird on me, or whether it's I believe this or believe that. And now what happens is we begin to isolate, we pull back, and we sort of hold ourselves closely because we say, I can't believe or trust anything. Nothing's authentic anymore. So it's very easy to get fall into that trap. And now hey, we're pointing fingers at everything. We become cynical and suspicious of everything. It's just I don't trust anything anymore. I would venture to say, put yourself in front of a mirror, an emotional mirror, a mirror of character and, and sit there and go, as much as there's angst, am I an authentic person? Am I the same person when no one's watching as when everybody's watching? What do I need to do to become an authentic person? In 1976, my grandfather invited me at the age of 12 to shadow him to San Diego. He'd come up with the idea, my suspicion, it was actually my grandmother's idea, that said, why don't you take each one of your grandchildren, one at a time, to shadow you when you go do your meetings. Well, I'm the oldest, so I got to go first. I feel sorry for the younger ones, because I don't think they ever actually got to experience it, because there's so many grandchildren. So we go to San Diego, and those times he would go for about two weeks. And as he'd go for about two weeks, the first four or five days, he would go meet with the press, maybe with city leaders, his team, maybe a few VIPs, whatever. And then they would have the meetings for five, six, seven days, and then there would be two or three days of wind down, and then he would leave. So I'm this 12-year-old impressionable boy, and I get to go with Daddy Bill to San Diego. We went to the Top Gun school before Tom Cruise popularized Top Gun. We actually went there, and I met Tom Gun. I met this Top Gun guy, and as a 12-year-old kid, sit in the jet and be like, meet a real wartime hero. You know, to be on the backstages of the channel news station and to meet the reporters and to shake hands with the mayor and all those kinds of things are so impressionable for this young 12-year-old kid. I'll tell you, there's two things I remember most about that trip. Number one, there was never an inconsistency from the private man to the public man. Never. And you would expect, if you hung out with some, anybody for two weeks, nonstop, you'd find some kind of inconsistencies. Hang out with me for two hours, you will find inconsistencies. So here I am, this little 12-year-old kid, impressionable. Now, I wasn't looking for it, but you know I would have thought it and seen it. In other words, wait a minute. Daddy Bill talks this way in front of thousands of people. But the way he talks to the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant or the gossip he talks to in the car on the way back to the hotel room or, or that dirty joke he said or as a 12-year-old kid that would rest heavy, never, ever, ever saw it. Number two, remember one of the meetings, um, typically what happens after the end of the meetings, he does the altar call and all that, and as the people come forward and there's prayer counselors, they bring the service to a close, and then he leaves the stage and he gets into a car, and a couple of his guys, and they provide a police escort back to his hotel. And not because he's a special guy, police escorts, because of all the traffic and just the congestion. And he would go back to his hotel, usually a normal hotel. Um, uh, he was, uh, Bill Marriott was a friend, so he gave him this special access to Marriott Hotel. So it's typically that. He'd go upstairs, order room service. It was never like Alaskan crab legs and filet mignons, always a hamburger and some french fries and then he would get two or three of his guys together and they would debrief that evening's meetings so he'd say okay tell me about the sermon that illustration i use what would you do differently tomorrow how about this how about and they would all sort of give their advice and i'm sitting there eating my hamburger in that room with them and he looks over at me my middle name is nelson so in the family i'm stefan nelson and he'd look over at me and go stefan nelson what do you think I'm a 12-year-old kid. I mean, I'm clueless. I hope and pray I didn't say anything. <laughs> now, I know me. I probably did. So the impression I that left me behind to this day, the fact that he would include me, not just, hey, sit over there, be quiet, eat your hamburger, and, you know, don't say anything. We got important stuff to do here because we're really important people. He would look at this little twerp, 
well, what do you think? And sincerely, and allow me to feel like I'm part of the family. I'm part of the team. I'm part of the body of Christ. And how impactful that is. I'm, to this day, we think about that. When, when you think about sitting around the dining room table with your family or your friends or you're at work and, you know, it, and like in meetings that I'm at, there's always that one person that sits in a meeting and their sole job is to take notes. Don't speak. Just take notes. Just take notes. Listen to all the stuff we're saying and write it all down. They're probably usually the smartest person in the room because they're hearing everything. But we're all talking and pontificating and stuff and they're just taking notes. That the, the opportunity to say to that person, hey, what do you say? What do you think? And some of you are those people. You're going, yeah, I'm that person taking the notes. And they, and they never ask me in my opinion. I got a lot of opinions. If you would just ask me, I could solve the company's problems. I could solve the church's problems. Just invite me in. The fact that Jesus invites us in, that's what the Great Commission is. Jesus, okay, guys, I'm heading up to heaven. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm coming back as the Holy Spirit. I got a job for you. Now, we all know the disciples. You're going, seriously, you entrusted this whole thing called church to these 11 characters? He goes, yeah, come on, I got a job for you. He includes us. I continue to think the other word that I associate of many is this word of a surrendered life. Um, Philippians 1.21 the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, Paul had this understanding. If I'm going to live, there's only one thing I'm living for, and that is Christ. And when, when I die, I'm better off, it's a gain. And I think about that in my own life. And I think, can I honestly say for me to live is Christ? Or is God just an appendage in my life? I mean, he's a good appendage. I mean, he's my security blanket. He comforts me when I'm sad. And I know that when I die, I get to go to heaven. And, and he's there for me. And it's good. But do I really live for him? My grandfather, there was a singularity in his life about the gospel, about the cross. You'd hear that word about the cross. Come to the cross. Because at the cross, it's level playing field. It's at that cross where, we, where God opens up our hearts and opens up our minds and lays it out, fillets it there before us and takes our broken lives and says, let me bring them back together. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on the day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. So my grandfather talked about the cross. He talked about the word of God. It's not just some poetic book. It's the word of God. He was obedient to the word of God. He had this healthy fear of sin. Why? Because sin would distract him and pull him away from God, pull him away from this relationship, pull him away from the word of God. And so you see this, this person who truly lived a surrendered life, truly to the place of saying, God, here I am, send me. And I think about that in my own life. And I can honestly say it's something that I think about regularly. Am I a surrendered person? Every day, Lord, I surrender this day to you. Surrendering, saying, God, I surrender my marriage to you. I surrender my health to you. I surrender my career, my hopes, my aspirations, my reputation. Everything about me, as Paul says, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. We want to talk about authenticity we have a world out there that's salivating for authenticity. And you and I call ourselves followers of Jesus. And it's about time that we, the church, or the big whole capital C, become authentic in our faith. Christianity is not a brand. It's not a bumper sticker. It's not a set of worship songs. And it's certainly not a TV station. It is the way I live my life. It's the way I conduct my life when no one's looking and when everybody's looking. Now, my grandfather was human. He made mistakes in his humility, in his integrity, in his authenticity, when he would make a mistake, and he was confronted with his mistakes. Those of you that want to read the history books, you will read about some severe mistakes he did, particularly when he got too close to Washington and to the Oval Office. 
There are some things he said on Nixon tapes that he had to go back and apologize profusely for because he got so close to the, to the power. He would be the first one to say, I, you know, I got, I got drawn in by that. I got seduced by that. And I no longer was the man that God made me become, and I repent of that. He would be open to all that kind of stuff. Why? Because my confidence is not in my ability. Guess what? Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in me will carry it on day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. What is it that you're struggling with? What is it that you're wrestling with? What is it that's going on in your life that you say, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do next. Is it your marriage? Is it, is it your teenager? Is it that, that habit that you cannot break? Is it a hopelessness? Is it a battle with depression? What is it in our lives that say, Lord, please do this good work in me. I surrender my life to you. As I close, one of the common narratives right now. In fact, the Wall Street Journal yesterday had a headline saying, will there be another? And in light of who's the next Billy Graham? Is it some up and coming young evangelist in America? Is it some dynamic pastor? Is it some world leader in another foreign country somewhere? Who is God raising up to be the next Billy Graham? And we all look with longing as, this, as we watch this montage and say there was a time in our history where people were drawn to God and that we had prayer in our schools. And there was a time in our history that it was like there was a healthy time. We need that back. Who's going to be that person that's going to bring us back? Who's going to be that leader? You ask my grandfather that. He would probably be the best person to answer that question and go, well... I happen to know all the up-and-coming leaders coming around. Got my eye on that guy. Got my eye on that woman over there. That person's got it good. That would be this. Never. He'd say, you. You are the next Billy Graham. On the screen, you're going to see a picture of the last time I was with him and the last time I saw him alive. And uh, this was about maybe eight or nine months ago. Um, That is his right hand. Um, as you can tell, a feeble hand, a 98-year-old man's hand. He died at 99. Um, And then that's my hand on top of his hand. And as we linger on that picture, there's a a few thoughts that I've had as I've looked at that picture. Number one, very intrigued by where that hand has gone. Uh, I mean, that hand has been in certain places. That hand has shook the hands of world leaders, presidents, the Pope, business leaders, famous people, rich people, poor people, peasants, street people. I mean, that hand has been, oh, the amount of hands that that hand has shaken, 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 (laughs) shaken. And I think about that. But then a hand has also held a fork. I mean, that hand fed his body when he was eating those fries and that hamburger and And uh, when he enjoyed that hand, would pick up a glass of water. That hand would wrap himself around the arms of my grandmother as he came home for after being gone for months at a time, and that maybe would wipe away that tear in her eye as as he came home. Uh, That hand probably um, was used to sort of remind people of things. How many times that hand would hold up a Bible and talk about the Bible, the Bible? You know, you think about that hand. So there's a mundane part of that hand. I mean, there's things about that hand that just do what everybody's hand does. And then there's a part of that hand that was extraordinary. And then there's my hand on top of that. And there's some similarities in terms of my hand picks up a fork and my hand gives my wife a hug and my hand shakes people's hands. But this is also a picture of legacy. Not my legacy, our legacy. In other words, my grandfather's a very unique man that lived in a very unique time. And I don't know if we will ever see that in our lifetime, that same kind of scene in that situation. We live in different times, vastly different times than my grandfather did. But as God imparts himself in your heart and in my heart, the influence that I have in my little world my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my neighborhood, 
the place of work. I've got this little footprint that God has given to me and says, be faithful, be the hands and feet of Jesus in this little footprint. For some of you, it's caring for an aging parent. And you may go, life is bypassing me while all my friends are having a really good time and, you know, accomplishing all kinds of stuff. And my life is boring and mundane. Maybe, maybe you're at home mom, an at-home mom and you're just taking care of kids and changing diapers and going to the grocery store, you know, and you're like, this is not what I signed up for. I mean, my life is not very attractive right now. No, do not think that for a second. Because God has uniquely called you into a place and says, okay, for now, I want you to just be the hands and feet of Jesus to these four little kids in your living room, or to this aging parent over here, or to that little office that you help manage, or that little group of people in your neighborhood that that you've gotten to know. This is the opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and make this contagious faith that we've been placed in our hearts. Here's this, one of my favorite verses as I close. 2 Peter 3.15. Here's what it says. Be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you and do it with gentleness and respect. I love that. Be ready always. Now, most of us think, of, oh, oh, that's uh, apologetics. I better have all my Bible verses, all the facts and figures, because as I talk to my friends and people that don't know Jesus, they start asking me all kinds of weird questions like, hey, uh, this God is such a God of love that you talk about. Why did a 19-year-old kid, you know, take an AR-15 and go shoot 17 kids in a high school 10 miles from where I live. I mean, what kind of God? And there are a lot of things could happen. The gun could have jammed. You know, the Uber driver never showed up. Something happened that all of a sudden he doesn't do it. I mean, that, what kind of God is that? And you're like, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Be ready always. Well, I'm not ready for that one. So you know what? I'm going to just believe in Jesus because when I die, I'll go to heaven. But other than that, I'm keeping my mouth shut because everybody is pretty antagonistic these days. And last thing I need to do is have someone jumping down my throat about my love for Jesus. So I'll just won't say anything. So be ready always. And not really ready. No, that's not what he's saying. Be ready always to give a reason. Reason of what? Hope. Not a reason for life and a reason why someone shoots people in a school, a reason for this and a reason for that. He's not asking you to defend all that. Hope. Now, many of us as Christians walk around with no hope. I mean, you look at yourself and you go look at yourself in the mirror and go, why would anybody ever ask me about hope? Because you can just look at my face and I'm just a hopeless kind of guy. I just walk around. Everything's bad. It's so terrible. I don't know. I can't wait to get out of here. And people go, wow, you're like a really, you're a downer. I don't want, there's no hope in your life. I'm never going to ask. No, we are supposed to live with hope. Why? Why do I have hope? Do I have hope because I have all the answers? Absolutely not. I have hope because I'm confident that he who began a good work in me will carry it on the day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. I remember asking my grandfather a question about some end time stuff, you know, probably rapture stuff. It's a consistent theme around here these days. And my grandfather simply looked at me and said, I don't know. Don't know? I mean, you're Billy Grant. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, if, if, I've come to the end of the line here. I mean, need an answer. Don't know. So you can live in the I don't know and still love Jesus? Oh, yeah. I can live in that tension. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So I think about, so who's the next? As the Wall Street Journal says, will there be another? What do you mean, will there be another? There already is another. It's you. It's us. It's we, the Christian community, the Christian church that can go around to this hopeless world and say, hey, my life is as difficult as your life. I lost my job like you did. I'm battling cancer like you did. My kids are driving me crazy like your kids are driving me crazy. But unlike you, I got hope. So I got this hope in me. I've got this great hope. Hope in what? Hope in God for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And now they go, hmm, you got hope. Explain that to me. Give me a reason for that hope. And then you just tell your story. Well, let me tell you my story. I don't have all the answers. I'm like Billy Graham. I don't know everything. And then do it with gentleness. We don't have a lot of that these days. With respect. We don't have a lot of that these days. Some of the most hopeless people are people that the thing they need from you right now is they need a gentle heart. And they need to be respected as you share with them this incredible thing. Jesus did that. Watch his life. So as I close in prayer, 
you think about someone like a Billy Graham, and there's a tendency for us to sort of be like bleacher Christians. Like we're sitting there going, wow, what an amazing man. We need more people like that. And then you just sort of check it off and you go back to the same old, same old. Own it. It's your story. It's your story. Now, you may never fill a stadium. I, I certainly won't. But you've got friends over a pizza. They go, hey, what's going on? And you share your story. You've got neighborhoods where you've got neighbors dying of cancer and dealing with car accidents and walking their dog every morning and they're distraught and they have no place to go except the bottle or the local happy hour or some internet friend. And you go, I've got the hope. Why don't I just give them a little bit? That's what it's all about. That's what God has called us to do. Be confident as he began a good work in the care of the day of completion, day of Christ Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Our dearly Father, as we bring our time to a close, I thank you for this church, because it is a church of hope. I mean, we live in a strategic part of the country here. I mean, Leesburg, Washington, D.C., all the stuff that goes on here. And these men and women, Lord, they're like yeast. They've been placed in this community by the thousands. And I pray, Lord, that as we think about our lives, we will find ourselves perhaps here in the next few hours alone. Maybe it's in our bedroom. We find ourselves maybe going the extra mile and actually getting on our knees and saying, Dear Jesus, I love you. I've been struggling with this or that. And we'd have our story and we'd talk to you. We surrender ourselves. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, as we go about this week, Lord, there's an extra skip in our step. doesn't mean everything is perfect, but we sense your presence. We sense your infilling. There's this new perspective on things that we never had before. And we're going to hear a lot about this amazing child of yours called Billy. We're going to hear a lot about him this week. But Lord, I pray that we realize that he's not just your child. He was our brother in Christ. He loved you like I love you. You're our dad. We're part of the same family. And then I own it. So, Lord, what, what assignment do you have for me? I said, you guide us and lead us. You protect us from foolishness. You protect us from being discouraged. Lord, I, I said, you provide for us. I pray, Lord, that we would have a hope that just oozes out of us. People go, what is with you? You're such a person of hope. And it's not just fabricated. We talk about being authentic. No, Lord, we want it to be real because of what you've done for us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.